Hello, it's Dan and Adam here. We've already recorded the podcast, but we realised something shortly afterwards. Yeah, uh, because of the date, uh, this will be out just before Christmas, and so will be our last episode of the year as well. So we've we've hit approximately one episode per month, which we're pretty happy about, but we, we think we could do better, so we'll try and continue or improve upon that in 2019. Of course, and honestly, thank you guys so much for listening to us. We really appreciate the support you've given us over the last six months, and we know we have a niche readership, but hopefully over time that'll grow as we continue to explore the worlds of physics and engineering. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. It was some great fun for us to research and record. But from both of us, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and see you in 2019. Merry Christmas, everyone. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Absolutely. Hello and welcome to Sparks and Quarks, a podcast all about science, mainly physics and engineering. I'm Dan and I'm joined today by Adam. How are you, Adam? Hey, Dan. How are you? I'm good today. I'm, I'm not too bad. I'm, uh, I'm feeling a little bit worse for wear. I'm not, not amazing at the moment, but, but ready to, to tell you some cool stuff and to find out some cool stuff. But well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a shame that you're feeling a bit under the weather, but you know, yeah, it happens, doesn't it? And, uh, Absolutely. You've got to yeah. learn to live through it. Yeah, but it's been, it's what, been about three weeks or so since our last episode. Yeah, so, yeah. Much, what, what, what have you been up to in that time? Well, I've been doing an awful lot of uni work. Um, oh, yeah. It's deadline season at the moment, so... Oh, of course. It's uh, been a bit hot and heavy with with uh, the uni work. Yeah. Um, had a lot of labs, lab, lab stuff going on and uh, a lot of coding deadlines, that kind of thing. And um, actually today I took a bit of time off of my uni study and went to Airbus in Filton. Oh, yes. You, yeah, because you told me about this on chat, but I haven't actually heard about it. So, so tell me what that was like, because I've never been. It yeah, really cool. so, I mean, um, it was really cool. We just went for a tour with the Physics Society at the University of Bristol. Um, and we basically saw their uh, integration and testing for their landing gear um department there and we also saw their wing manufacture section for the a400m which was very interesting because it's a massive plane if you don't know what the a400m is give it a google it's a big big military aircraft bit of a beast oh is it okay it's only military it's not not civilian yeah no it's it's the military one one of the big boys the ones that carry tanks okay I'm having a look at my oh yeah I'm having a look at that oh that is yeah it reminds me of a Hercules yeah yeah yeah, yeah. places a Hercules oh that is a secky boy so yeah saw so all the wing manufacturing process for that um it was very cool oh nice one cool well I've been having uh some quite some quite fun times out here really um yep. so you know I've been d- doing the standard kind of you know work just getting busier and busier and having more and more responsibility which is fun but also terrifying when you realize that like it's almost it's like just me I I think maybe it's not just me but I'm one of a very small team that are handling customer claims across all of Denmark Sweden and Norway oh wow I'm going I'm 25 and this is a terrifying level of responsibility but fine let's do it um sure I mean it's a hell of an opportunity Oh yeah, and it look, looks great on the CV. Oh yeah, um, of course. But so it works great. But it was what I've been doing outside of work that I've had the most fun with. I don't know whether you saw on Facebook. I recently attended two musical improv comedy classes. Right. Um, so I've been attending uh, just sort of conventional comedy improv classes out here. I've done sort of six classes, um, sort of learning the techniques and sort of. It, it, it basically is playing games in class. The, the later sort of level level three, level four classes, you do the more advanced stuff, like how to actually make a scene. But sure. early classes is just, just games. But musical improv. So have you ever watched Whose Line Is It Anyway? No, I can't say I have. Oh, mate, you're missing out. Right. So Whose Line Is It Anyway is, well, it started out as a British TV show and then it moved to America and it's an improvisational panel show basically comedy well it's not a panel show it's a comedy game so you've got a host and then you've got four performers four improvisers and they are given there's various different games uh so like one of them is called scenes from a hat where they just have um loads of different uh scenes from a hat yeah so that's it they 
they have a hat that they pass around the audience that audience put suggestions in and then they get the suggestions back and they have to like improvise scenes around those suggestions oh, okay yeah um, i know the concept yeah yeah it's, uh, it's very 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 funny there's some uh, colin mockery and ryan styles are probably the two best known names from it uh but there's also uh, greg proops clive anderson was one of the original hosts um there's a whole raft of people looking up there's loads of it on youtube as well because it is it's just amazing yeah i have to give but, some a watch definitely yeah but they do uh, they do some musical improv rounds right. where they have some musician backers so they have to do things like coming up with songs you know just off the back of someone's oh, okay, suggestion on the spot kind of thing yeah so there's a couple which um uh are like here's a suggestion now you've got to sing this suggestion or sing about the suggestion in the style of pop or in the style of a love ballad or stuff like that. And so then there'll be a musician uh, in the background who's kind of plays, who goes, okay, well, I'll play something that sounds like a love ballad or sounds rock or whatever. And then the performer has to perform along. Um, And the the, the two two best known games are probably um, uh, Irish uh, drinking game, where uh, each performer has to sing an individual line of an Irish drinking song. Right, and they have to make it rhyme, obviously. Uh, and there's also a hoedown, um, where it's an American hoedown, and they have to create a, a short, so I think it's four, maybe six line song. I can't remember. Um, that rhymes is also a funny story. So it's abs- they're absolutely hilarious, but they're also, as I found out, very very tricky. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's not an easy uh, an easy no. skill to have. So the musician on whose line is, well, one of them is a lovely lady called Laura Hall. Okay. And she and her husband, Rick, uh, are in Europe at the moment. And they've just taught, they've been teaching a couple of improv comedy classes before they're doing, well, they're in Europe because they're doing a live whose line show in London um, this weekend uh, coming up, which dates the episode, um, but which I'm lucky enough to go and see. All right, um, awesome. But... Yeah, so they thought, well, while we're over in Europe, let's do some improv comedy courses. Courses. So I saw it and I went, this is a once in a lifetime I want you to see. Let's yeah, do definitely. it. Signed up. Three hour class on Friday evening, six hour class on Saturday. And then we performed on Saturday evening. So I ended up um, doing uh, a duet game where basically we were given a suggestion of like a professional relationship. There were two of us, obviously, because a duet. Professional relationship. And then... Uh, so we were given uh, horse tamers. It's like, okay, sure. I guess we're singing about horse tamers. Okay. So then L- Laura started playing this kind of, well, we, we did this little sort of maybe one, one and a half minute little skit that we improvised at the start. And then my sort of like partner started singing about being a horse tamer and sort of what that was like. And then I then came in and started singing when she stopped singing. And then we sang kind of with each other as 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 a duet. But because we were singing in the same key, and it, it just worked as a duet. Um, okay. I managed. I managed to rhyme. I managed to get laughs. I made it funny. It. It was so much fun. That sounds I, like a lot of fun. I must admit, it was amazing. It's, and I'm just like, right. Well, I. I guess this is what I do now. I'm yeah. gonna find a way to do musical I mean, improv. It's. It's not something that I would be able to do if. If I was faced with that kind of thing, just being able to do that, I just would not be able to do it at all. I'm not what you'd say as a, uh, a comedic guy in by any means <laughs> i don't know man it's because because uh, i i was of the same mindset beforehand i was like okay well you know uh, maybe I, I like to think of myself as funny sometimes but i'm not sure i've got the skills yeah but sure yeah, yeah after that's the course like. and it's it's just learning to think on your feet right that's, that's all it is and the the, the the comedy comes from you don't even realize sometimes like how good it is because you, you open your mouth and you'll sing see say or sing something and you won't have thought about it. It will literally just be the first thing that pops into your head. And it's just naturally funny. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah, I advise anyone to give it a go. Because like as with all comedy, it can be a bit hit and miss, of course. But when it works, it is absolutely amazing. Yeah, um, I bet. Yeah. So that's what I've been up to. I've just been having a grand old time doing oh, improv comedy in Denmark, tell you as what, you do. Despite the illness, uh, it sounds like you're having a bloody brilliant time out there. Oh, yeah, I'm loving it. It's amazing. <laughs> Oh man! Anyway, we, we're not here to, as much as I'd love to talk about uh, comedy with you because it's a, 
a topic I love. It's not what we're here for, is it? It's not, no. No. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we've got a couple of topics we're going to talk about. Uh, do you want to take the first one? Yeah, I, th- I think I'll take the first one this week. Yeah, go for it. So, yeah, tell, so me, um, tell me more. So, this week, Dan, mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to be talking about quantum entanglement to study structures of a group of proteins called flavins, which are enzymes that are essential for energy metabolism in the body. Okay. Now, what's, what's, what actually made me quite happy about that is I recognise most of those words and I think I can understand the concept. Yeah. Beyond that, I've no idea. So please I'll tell t- me more. I'll tell you what, like, it's, it's something that is, uh, this is a bit of a mix. It's obviously, you've got your, your physics in there from the quantum entanglement and then you've got mm-hmm. a lot of biology and chemistry as well from... Of course. Uh, the, obviously, the, the enzymes in the body and then the chemistry from the techniques... Um, mm-hmm. which are, well, at, at a core, they're physical techniques, but um, they used an awful lot for chemical compositions and stuff. But anyway, I will get back to that. So, this whole sort of topic, uh, looking at protein structures um, with light, is something that's been done traditionally by using very powerful laser microscopes. Um, mm-hmm. However, this will often result in damage of the sample because the intensity of the laser can be quite high, uh, which means that a lot of the photons are, are scattered as they interact with the protein, but sure. they also cause a lot of a lot of damage to the protein as well. Right. So, the good thing about quantum entanglement is, or in this case at least, is that you you only have to use very few of them. Very few, uh, sorry, very few photons in order to Mm. actually get the same results. So, first of all, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of the background on on quantum entanglement because you know people hear quantum entanglement and they think, well, what the hell is that all about? You know, you've just said quantum and entanglement. People chuck quantum in front of anything, and it sounds like a load of hubba (laughs) jubba. Exactly, it's it's the way to get out of it's it's the classic. I'm in a sci-fi movie. We don't really know how to solve this. Uh, stick quantum in front of it, and it's the suddenly it's how we it's the, it's the Deus Ex Machina ex machina we were looking for. Yeah, it's like either quantum or nano. Nano is yeah, a good exactly. one as well. Yeah, but anyway, so um, this this was uh, led by a guy called Theodore Goodson at the University of Michigan, mm-hmm. um, and essentially quantum entanglement is really quite an incredible phenomenon. That, like physically it's it's actually just unbelievable because basically what it means and and i'm saying this at very basic levels is that yeah. um two particles or yeah so we'll go for particles two particles can act as a single physical object rather than two but only okay. in terms of their properties Oh, okay. So it's not it's not as if like if you were say had two hydrogen atoms and you knocked one hydrogen atom, the second one would also move in an identical manner. It's their properties are identical. Yes. So it's not it's nothing to do with the motion or where they are in space or time or anything like that. They could be as far away as possible. They could be on opposite sides of the universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if they're entangled, they will still share the same properties. So if you change the state of one of these particles, so when I say state, I mean a quantum state, so either the wave number or the wavelength or something like that, Mm -hmm. then the other particle will instantaneously also have that property changed. Right. No matter how far away they are in space. Okay, I think we've... Sorry, Adam, I just need to uh, bring you up on this. This is a physics and engineering podcast, not a bloody magic podcast. So uh, yeah. uh, I'm going to need to ask you to choose another topic. I tell you what, <laughs> I know, I know. It does seem like it, but actually it's it's something that can be explained through the Copenhagen interpretation. Copenhagen, which is quite funny Ooh, as soon as yeah, though you're in Denmark. <laughs> how, how apt, yeah. Yeah, but, um, but obviously you're thinking, well, surely that implies information transfer at a speed faster than the speed of light. Yeah. And you'd be right. Wait, what? Yeah, you'd essentially be right. But through the Copenhagen interpretation, you can actually explain it um, as to why it's possible to do that. Because it, it, this information transfer is, is, impo- is um, it's instantaneous. So, but the thing is, it's not a physical... Um, when when stuff is limited by the speed of light, it's to do with uh, a physical interaction and a physical yeah. uh, a physical. What word am I looking for? I'm looking for a word. I cannot think of it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's a physical change of a physical See, that, transfer I've, I've of information is basically what it is. Thank you. Um, yeah, we were both struggling there, <laughs> but, but yeah, but in this case, it it's not physical. So through the Copenhagen interpretation, you can explain it, and I'd be more than happy to redirect any viewer to a YouTube video, uh, which will explain it. But mm -hmm. for the terms of this podcast, we're just going to leave it at that. You just have to accept that quantum entanglement allows instantaneous transfer of information between uh, entangled particles. Okay, I'm, I'm going to okay. go for scientific suspension of disbelief here and say, yes, I agree with you. Okay. Carry on. Brilliant. <laughs> So for now, all we need to know is that by sending two photons through a type of crystal called beta barium borate, uh, they become entangled. Oh, the, the, the old triple B. Yeah, the triple B, triple B <laughs> crystals. Gotta love them. Um, and so by measuring one state of the photon, you know the state of the entangled pair. Right, okay. Because they're entangled. That's the definition of what an entangled photon is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So then what is essentially done in this process of of looking at these structures of proteins, you send these in quantum um these quantum entangled photons to the structure. They interact in all sorts of ways, diffract, do all this fancy shebang that things do when they're really small. And um and then one of the, the photons, one of the entangled photons is, is measured and it's measured using spectroscopy. Spectroscopy. Put, put your teeth in now. Yeah, yeah. Put, <laughs> put my teeth back in. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what's happening is the entangled photons are exciting electrons in the protein structure. Um, and after a short period of time, these excited electrons are dropping back into a natural energy state which basically means that um, each each electron, while it's orbiting an atom, will be in a certain energy state corresponding mm -hmm. to that material. Uh, yeah. When you interact, uh, when you transfer energy into that electron through a photon, yeah, that uh, electron absorbs the energy, and because it absorbs the energy, it has to move up uh, an energy level. Yeah, so, it ju yeah, it jumps to a higher energy it, it, state. Yeah, exactly. So then, as it falls back down to its natural energy state, it releases another photon with the yes. energy that is corresponding to the difference in the two energy states. I, I was going to say, this sounds familiar. Wasn't this part of what Simon's video of Raman spectroscopy was? Yes, it's yeah. similar. But okay. this time, there's something additional that entangled photons can do with this mm -hmm. so basically what we're doing is we're analyzing the photons that are um that are released through this excitation process mm -hmm. uh, which shows very specific properties of the pro protein structures it shows you what it's made out of which is through simon's video um the raman spectroscopy this is very very similar it's spectroscopy so you know, it's going to be similar. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to watch that, uh, we'll have a link in the show notes, by the way, if you want a bit mm -hmm. more information on spectroscopy and a very special form of it called Raman spectroscopy. Yeah. Anyway, so what's interesting is that additional information is observed when you analyze the photons after they've been produced by entangled photons rather than your bog standard, I'll, I'll say classical photon, but I don't mean it in a classical sense. I mean it in a quantum sense. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to quote something now from the article that I got, and this is directly from uh, one of the members of the team at the University of Michigan who uh, did this research. So okay. it says, for example, in photosynthesis, when photons provide energy to the for the photosynthetic reaction center, the mechanism of this effect could be enhanced by using quantum light. With an entangled photon excitation process, it may be possible to optimize as well as enhance the energy transfer process in biological systems. This could lead to new information about the chemical and biological processes in these naturally occurring biological complexes. Okay, brain processing, but it's saying that we could potentially, by using this quantum entanglement, we could improve improve our understanding of photosynthesis and how 
how plants well as you said that how plants biologically operate yeah so it's looking at the um we can look at the energy transfer processes in these biological systems and processes um with a lot because more information than, about them because rather than directly examining the biological process which as you said could cause damage to it we can examine the quantum entangled sort of partner exactly that's then released and, and that's only okay, possible that's cool. because we're using um much less photons so mm-hmm. when instead of just bombarding the sample with a, a shitload of photons we're using mm-hmm. a lot less photons so uh, and the intensity is a lot lower so you're not damaging the structure as you make your measurements yeah which is uh, obviously much more uh, or at least much better in terms of making your measurements because you you don't get the damage you are able to observe the full the full process in its natural sense i mean absolutely i mean if you look into the definition of an observation you could say that actually you still are are affecting the process by observing it alone which the copenhagen Mm -hmm. copenhagen interpretation will completely agree with to make an observation you have to affect something um yeah so in that sense, yeah, there's that, but we're affecting it so much less than when we're using so all these many, many photons that it's actually oh, just you. really, really useful. Okay, yeah. So what this is doing is essentially opening up new imaging techniques um, to look at many, many, many different types of biological and organic structures, mm-hmm. which is just obviously super interesting. I, I just found yeah. that super cool. Yeah, it is. But yeah, that that was only a short one for me today. Um, Obviously, if you want any more information on quantum entanglement, there is a lot of stuff on the internet that you have to be very, very careful with because a lot of it is a load of mumbo jumbo made up by people who don't really understand quantum physics. I don't myself fully understand quantum physics. No, Um, I I have. You will understand more than me and I'm completely, yeah, I get completely lost when I try and even think about it i mean at at uni now i'm just having my first course in quantum physics and it's extremely difficult to get your head around Um, yeah but it's so so interesting the double slit experiment still just astounds me oh yeah i I still i still don't understand how that works should we talk about it quickly seeing as though my my yeah why not sure yeah yeah the double slit experiment it's probably you know i mean you're probably the sort of the more expert on this than I am, but I'd say that's probably the most, apart from Schrodinger's cat, which obviously was just a thought experiment. It's probably the best known sort of quantum experiment that's I, out there. I tell you what, actually, there's something that I've been looking up for um, my lab work, uh, which is mm-hmm. basically um, we were looking at uh, a type of experiment called a quantum eraser, and basically right. what this does is because if you have the normal double slit experiment then you can't measure which slit the photon has gone through without breaking up the interference pattern right yeah so actually it doesn't matter whether you look at whether you measure which slit has gone through before the slit or after it goes through the slit it it doesn't matter if you know which slit it's gone through you collapse the wave function and there is no interference full stop yeah yeah but what's really cool is that there's actually a um, a variation of this experiment called a delayed choice uh, a delayed choice quantum eraser experiment, right? Which uses the young slit. Um, it uses the the same apparatus, but mm-hmm. it, what it does is, uh, at least in this variation, is it uses one of those uh, beta barium borate crystals after it passes through the slit, right? Um, so when when a photon has passed through, you actually end up creating two entangled photons. Yeah. Now, if you refract one of these photons so that it goes in another direction uh, than its entangled partner, mm-hmm. it doesn't... Right, so what, that one entangled pair will go and interact or not interact at the... Or interfere, sorry... It will interfere or not interfere at a screen. You then send the other photon in another direction, mm-hmm. but you set up the paths of it uh, and the refraction 
so that you will you can put a beam splitter in its path and you can cause uh, it to trigger a detector so you know which which slit the photon has gone through right uh, are you getting what I'm saying any questions at this point because it's so okay so is this so you, you you've shot you've shot a photon yep it it has it has gone through one of the slits. Yeah, it goes goes through. Let let's think of it in in a classical sense. So this is a very classical sense of thinking that yeah. it, it goes through a slit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it then passes through the triple B crystal. Yep. Uh, it then gets quantum entangled. You then have two photons traveling out of this crystal. Yep. One of them continues as per and hits a screen. Yep. The other one is redirected, refracted uh, towards a beam splitter, yep. which then splits it splits it out. Or well, you can think of it as a mirror, not just a, a beam splitter. Uh, the beam right, splitter okay. comes in later on for the actual quantum eraser, but you can think of it as just a mirror at this point. Right. Okay. So yeah. So it's a mirror reflected off. Uh, sorry. And what happens after? And then after that? That, that, that will then trigger a detector. Right. I see. Okay. So what you have is is two oh, parts. So you have so you haven't broken up the interference pattern because you've still hit the screen, but because you've got been quantum entangled, you've then been able to, to sort of, de- as you say, detect that sort of that second photon. photon that you created. Yes, but what's interesting is what you said there was wrong. Oh, okay. Now, if you if you set it up so that the screen. Um, the duration for the photon to hit the screen and the duration of the other photon to reach the detector. Mm-hmm. So you could make the the duration of the photon going to the detector a hundred billion times longer in duration than that of which the photon takes to the other photon takes to interact with the screen. Right. Yeah? Okay. So yeah. so it takes but I, loads, I, I loads, 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 loads longer. Purely just by sort of positioning the detector further away, yeah, sure, from the crystal than the screen. Okay, yep. So as long as those two photons stay entangled, mm-hmm. the right, and this is where it gets really, really messed up. As soon as you detect that photon, yeah, you gain knowledge of its of something called its uh, which path information, which means that you know which slit it has gone through. Oh, okay. So w- when you said which path, I just went straight back to magic. W I T C H. I was like, I-, I knew it. I knew that quantum was bloody magic. <laughs> uh, it, well, you could think of it that way, honestly. But yeah. no. So, um, so you're detecting this this entangled partner. So let's say two years after the interference pattern should occur at the screen. Let's say that. Yeah. But because you have detected the photon you gain complete knowledge of its which path information right Mm. and actually what that does is is it transfers that information to its quantum partner and you get no interference pattern at the screen because it knows that at some point in the future it's going to be its partner is going to be detected whoa 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 what yep sorry what yep that's a legitimate phenomena. That's... I, th- I think part of my brain just exploded. That is so weird. And, I mean, I'm not sure and if this so is right. cool. But the way that I've thought about it is that the quantum entangled partners transfer information at faster than the speed of light. If you think of yeah. it in that way... Then you think Therefore, as soon as something travels of, faster of than the time speed of light, possible. then you can travel back in time, right? Oh my god! So basically, what it's doing is saying that um, the information of the quantum entangled pair, as soon as it gets detected, transfers that information back in time because it's traveling faster than the speed of light to its entangled yeah. partner, and it knows it cannot do any interference. Because you have complete, because an observer has complete knowledge of the witch path information. Oh, that's, I've, I've actually got slight chills down my spine. That's yep. holy crap! And obviously, you have two detectors um, because the paths of 
uh, a photon that's traveled through one slit is slightly different to that that's of, of one that's traveled through the other slit yeah of course so you would need you need a detector for each slit so yeah you know need a detector for each slit and then as soon as one of those goes off you you know which path it's gone through and yeah. then there's a slight extension onto that um where you add in something called a quantum eraser which is uh again it can be any at any distance but instead of having a mirror you have um a couple of mirrors and a beam splitter and basically you converge the two rays so that um or well, the two photon paths, so that the photon could interact with either detector. So right. uh, you have two detectors that can be triggered by either one, which is which has passed through either slit. It doesn't matter which slit it passes through, but okay, you so, know that so, a photon so has travelled through has one through. of okay, the slits. So it's, so it's it's taking the the advantage that you have two detectors and therefore are able to detect which slit it's passed through. And removing that advantage because the photon could hit either of them. It doesn't matter which. Exactly. And so what what information you gain from that is you know a photon has passed through the slit mechanism, the young slit but mechanism, you don't, but you don't, but know, you don't which know which one which it's passed slit. through. Yeah. And so... So do you get an interference pattern then? You do. You do get oh an interference pattern. Yep. Oh my God! Yeah. Because you Adam. have no information of which path it has travelled th- down. Why have you got to break my brain like this? And actually, in a quantum sense, just to break your brain even more, you oh, can actually no. <laughs> use do, do this on a single photon level, so you only shoot one photon through. Say you're doing the exact same experiment uh, at, let's say, a million different places on the planet. Yeah. And everyone at the same time fires one photon through, uh, through the slit, through, yeah. or through the slits. You can actually think of um, the single photon as acting like a wave because uh, photons have this wave-particle duality, right? Yep. So it travels as a wave, um, and one way I've heard this said is that you basically produce a load of ghost photons, and these photons travel through both slits it's one photon travels through both slits and interferes with itself and then if you combine all of the results from uh the screens in into one sort of information graphic so you take the data of where the exact position where that photon has interacted with the screen and Let's say you place them all on top of each other so you have one place where you can see where every photon has hit. So this is from all the experiments around the world? From all the one million experiments around the world, yeah, you will get an interference pattern. Oh my god. There is so much we don't understand about this universe. <laughs> so, so much. I tell you what, we're on our way to understanding that and that's the crazy thing. But I just wanted to to share that because I found out about that experiment um, uh, last week as part of as part of my lab work. Yeah, and it, it blew my mind. But that, um, I hope oh. I've done the experiment justice, really. Well, but um, I, there are again I, I, there are videos on YouTube which explain this probably a whole lot better than I have. I don't know, man. I mean, you, you explained it, and I can understand the concept, and so I think you've done pretty bloody well. Yeah, I mean, it's a very sort of the way I've explained things has been a very classical way of thinking but just because yeah. getting into a quantum thought process is really really difficult oh yeah but yeah oh um, I'll tell you what oh, let, let's leave brain. it there for my topic because I, I think yeah. I think quantum it's super interesting but it is I, yeah don't get me wrong it is very very interesting but you do have to yeah, you should have warned me. You have to, you have to prepare sorry, yourself sorry, mentally Dan. to think about you it. You do really have to have to think about it very hard. God, I can, I can feel the steam coming out my ears. Right, okay. So um, now that we've uh, truly taxed our brains thinking about uh, quantum theory, yeah. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us on to something, something fairly quite majorly different we're, we're not thinking on a sort of particle level here we're thinking very much macro physical world level so uh, when you were a kid yeah what did you think the future would look like you know I, I don't know whether you ever saw like books or 
stuff online or pictures of like you know what the future looked like but what, what did you have an image of the future uh, as? Uh, well the image of the future for me was definitely the picture painted by busted's year 3000 oh god so th- th- this is where my uh lack of uh sort of uh knowledge in pop culture really oh, comes into it it was a song own. that i grew up on as a kid um oh yeah I, not I, much I, has changed you, but we you, live underwater we live underwater i i know the song though i was around for the song don't be wrong but i have no idea as to what the picture was uh it's it's just the let's say it was the the picture painted in my own brain of, of oh the, i see what you mean yeah. right okay yeah gotcha um okay so okay i mean fair enough i mean we Sadly, we are kind of going that way, and the world is probably going to get flooded because we're going to warm it up too much. Global but that's warming. Not what we're... Uh, we prefer climate change, actually. It's more accurate. Uh, true. Um, okay, sorry, Dan. <laughs> that's all right. But so that's not actually... What, so when I was younger, when I thought of the future, I thought the big thing was going to be flying cars. Of course, right? yeah. So, you know, you, you think about it like... It's, you know, back to the future, the DeLorean, you know, that's flying. And you have this image of, you know, bubble cars that fly around... I had a book when I was younger about traveling to the future in which there was a flying car that was a time machine they traveled in. Very, very cool. Futurama as well. you got to remember yeah, Futurama. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. So flying cars themselves, you know, are a thing. We've, we've had some attempts and there's been some cool concept designs. Yep. And we've even managed to get some designs that started approaching production. Mm-hmm. You know, people can actually buy. I mean, they're in the range of hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you could actually, you know, place an order for one. Sure. Um, however, I'm going to focus on something that's not quite a car but it certainly fits the image of the flying car that everyone is using to travel around the city right i um, think i might have an idea what you're on about oh ah, i'm gonna be talking go, go, sorry go on is is this um a company that the amazon ceo created oh i don't know whether I, he's involved I, I can't remember the name of it I don't know whether the Amazon CEO... So I'm going to be talking about electric aircraft. Oh, no, that's not what I was thinking of. Oh, okay. okay, right. I try and so, find the name of the, the company I was thinking of, just so that you can have yeah. a look as well. Yeah, but, um, good idea. but yeah, you go ahead. Okay, so electric aircraft, okay, they, they aren't revolutionary. Sure. You know, they're, they're, I mean, they're revolutionary in that they have things that revolve to make them fly, but, they, you know, they're not new. So the, the first electric airship was as early as 1883, Really? Um, wow. Yeah. I, which I was, I was looking up and I went, really? That early? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, and then in 1917, there was an electric helicopter. Now, admittedly, it drew its power from a ground-based generator and then a cable that went to the helicopter. And to uh, describe okay. it as dodgy would be a kindness. Yeah, that, that sounds <laughs> pretty dodge. Yeah, but the point is it proved the concept that, you know, barring the fact that their, their fuel source was too heavy and cumbersome it could work so it wouldn't be until 1973 that the technology was ready for a full-size electric plane uh, which was a converted motor glider that flew somewhere between 9 and 14 minutes Uh, records are a little uncertain as to sort of what it actually was okay anyway since then uh, we're coming come back to my favourite topic, batteries. Um, battery tech has advanced and material tech has advanced um, and new designs have had more and more success. So the best known electric aircraft is probably Solar Impulse 2, uh, which you might know about. It's the, the Swiss-based experimental aircraft, you know, the one with the massive wings that are just covered in solar cells. Yes, I, yeah, uh, I do know about that one. Is, is it the really thin wings? Um, yes, and the yes, rotors, so ve- rotor blades, ve- very high aspect ratio wings. Yes, yeah, yeah. so it's got over se- seventeen thousand solar cells on its wings. Wow, okay. It's got four electric motor driven propellers. Um, it circumnavigated the globe in sixteen and a half months. That's how I know it. Yes, yep. exactly. Um, I think it's back in twenty fifteen to twenty sixteen. Um, but sixteen and a half months. It was actually only in the air for a total of twenty three days. Um, oh. It was just because obviously they had to wait for favourable conditions ah, to take yeah, of off. Course. Yeah. Um, so uh, it has a crew of one, uh, a takeoff speed of twenty two point four miles per hour, so fairly slow rollout. Yeah. Um, and a maximum airspeed of eighty seven miles per hour. So that slow rollout, as part of its design, as I said, you know, high aspect ratio wings. Sure. Its wingspan is almost matching that of the A three eighty. 
which oh, really? is the largest. Yes, yeah, which is the you largest. Mean, you mean the aircraft. double decker plane by Airbus? Yes, yes, yeah, that one. So wow, this is why when you said you went to Airbus, I was like, oh, I appear to have chosen the right topic. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so this plane's wings are massive. You know, very thin wings, but very massive, and only lifts one person. So that's a lot of space required. And I couldn't find the information on the sort of runway distance required for it to take off and land. But I can imagine it's going to be fairly sizable. You're not going to be, you know, taking yeah. off from a small, you know, 200 meter airfield. Oh, I don't no. know. Maybe it does take off. Maybe it does take off in 200 meters. It's only mm. takeoff speed of 22.4 miles per hour. Maybe it can. Um, I don't know. But, I feel like it would need to. Well, it doesn't need to uh, produce much speed, though, does it? So No, exactly. Maybe. And electric... And electric uh, engines, the, the advantage of them is... Um, you get really you good acceleration. Hu- really good acceleration because you have full torque straight from uh, when you start them, yeah. unlike sort of other motors. Yeah. Anyway, so the point is, yeah, lot of space to lift one person. But there's another concept that's been knocking around for a couple of years now. Very people have tried it. Okay. Uh, and in April 2017, an unmanned prototype took off. That's kind of... Yeah. So this was the Lilium Electric Jet. Wow, that sounds uh, so, sounds exhilarating. Oh, it is very, very cool. So in 2015, Lilium was set up in Germany by four engineers and PhD students who met when they were at university together in Munich. Okay. Uh, and they wanted, to, they wanted to design and build a small personal electric aircraft that was going to act as an air taxi. So it is much, much smaller than Solar Impulse because it doesn't oh. have huge wings. Oh, I've just looked at it. Oh, just oh done doesn't it look search. so cool? Oh my god, that oh, looks amazing! Mate. It doesn't it? Let, let, let me let me explain oh, yeah, things go to on, you. Because, go on. Honestly, but yeah, absolutely. They've it's so cool. Look it up. So it's going to be the first all electric VTOL aircraft in the world. So that's so is that vertical takeoff. Absolutely, and vertical VTOL vertical takeoff and landing. Yeah. So the Harrier jump jet is probably the best known of all the VTOL aircraft that we have. Sure. But there's also other aircraft like the uh, the Osprey, which is the uh, dual propeller yeah. um, American aircraft. So VTOL aircraft have the capability to enter the air vertically, they fly up, and then they start flying forward like a normal aircraft. Uh, when they reach their destination, it does the opposite and lands vertically. And the advantage they have is obviously they need very little space to take off because like helicopters, they just go up. Of course. But then because they start flying forward like a conventional aircraft, they have the sort of like the efficiency and the range or thereabouts of a normal aircraft. Hey, so you have the benefits of both helicopter and fixed wing planes. Also gain, is it is it more, it's, it's not more agility because a helicopter in general has more agility, but it can travel faster, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So b- because you've got that kind of, because you're using conventional wings, uh, y- yeah, you have that ability to have higher speeds and higher ranges because of it. Yeah. Um, so that that's the disadvantage of uh, sort of uh, helicopter or, you know, quadcopter multi-rotor aircraft is they're very maneuverable, but their range is pants because all of their lift is generated by the uh, the engines themselves rather than the structure of the aircraft. Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously, you know, you're using your power not just for for propulsion, but also to keep yourself in the air. So that drains your power reserves massively, whether that's fuel or electric. So uh, the Harrier uh, achieves its VTOL capability through a rotating jet nozzle. So it, it redirects its jet blast yeah. and it points it downwards and it goes up and then it redirects it backwards and it goes forward. Yeah. Um, the Osprey has uh, engine pods at the tips of its wings, which rotate. So when it's, ta- when it's taking off, the engine pods are pointing upwards. And then once it's in flight, uh, it slowly transitions them horizontally. And so it's like, it just looks like a normal uh, prop aircraft with props facing forward. Am I right in saying that the, the engines, when they are uh, during takeoff and landing, they are sort of look like they're built into the wing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the, the Osprey's ones are at the tip of it, but yeah, they, they, they are they are part of the wing right. essentially. Okay. Yeah. So they're, they're not mounted underneath. So, so yeah. So the Lilium Electric takes this concept. Um, calling it an electric jet is actually a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't actually use jet engines. Um, what it uses is thirty six electric motors that are driving ducted fans, which then generate the lift and propulsion. Okay. 
So uh, ducted fans are essentially a propeller mounted inside a tube. It's, at their core concept, that is what they are. Yep. So it's just take a propeller, draw a circle around it, make a tube, that's it. So the ducted fans themselves are mounted within flaps on the wing and the canard, which um, is sort of like a smaller front wing that provides, provides stability and lift. Um, and the flaps rotate kind of as required. So obviously when they're pointing downwards, uh, the flaps, or rather the, the ducted fans, provide lift. Yep. When they're pointed horizontally, they provide thrust, and the wings and the canard provide the lift. Okay. So why use ducted fans instead of normal pe- propellers? Because, you know, there's nothing to say you couldn't. Well, the ducts uh, reduce tip losses. That is, the aerodynamic losses caused by vortices generated by rotating propeller tips. Sure, which is so, why you normally have the winglets uh, on a conventional yes, aircraft. exactly. So the winglets break up the vortices that are generated, improving sort of like the efficiency. Um, so... Yeah, so the vortices, as I said, reduce efficiency, but they're also a source of noise from the aircraft. Yeah. Um, so obviously cut down on noise, especially if you're wanting to design something like an air taxi. If you've got 36 very noisy propellers that you're transporting someone in a taxi, that's going to be very distracting. Of course, so, we all know how loud um, like drones can get, and they're, they're relatively oh, yeah. low power. Exactly. So imagine uh, 36 props. So imagine, you know, eight quadcopters taking off around you that's um, going to be pretty loud it's massively loud now and if, if i recall each of those motors is about 8.8 kilowatts so and your normal oh, wow. drone motor okay. is around maybe 400 watts yeah sure so it's going to be very very loud very loud so anything you can do to reduce the noise is good now do, do you um, happen to know what the what the material is they use for the propellers i don't i would imagine so so this is I'm now thinking back to when I did uh, my drones project at university. I think we just had plastic props, but I think you can get carbon fiber, and they have designed the entire thing, the, the entire aero structure out of carbon fiber okay. because it's so strong and light. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was carbon fiber props. Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah, but I need to I need to double check. I couldn't find any information on that. Obviously, because it's a private company, they keep everything yeah, of fairly course, yeah. well locked down. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, ducted fans, be- so because they reduce the, uh, vortices, um, they're more efficient and because they're more efficient, that allows a smaller di- diameter propeller for the same static thrust. Okay. If you see what I mean? So yeah, you know, if you wanted to get a thrust of, you know, a kilonewton, you'd have to have a larger propeller, but a smaller ducted fan. Of course. Yeah. Um, obviously these are all good things. They do obviously have disadvantages like, um, if you have uh, sort of like aircraft that's going to go through varying angles of attack, which is the angle at which your aircraft is pointing through the air, or rather your, um, uh, yeah, I'm not, an, you know, I'm not strong on aerodynamics, but it is, yeah, it's basically the angle at which your aircraft is pointing through the air. Um, and I think it has to do with which way you're traveling as well. Sure. Wind, um, wind direction, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there's a risk of it stalling, uh, with with uh, varying angles of attack, um, and they have a complex design, and they need a very high tolerance because obviously you've got the propeller spinning around inside this tube. You want it to be close enough to the edge of the tube that you're going to not generate huge vortices, but far enough away that it's not constantly gouging against the inside of the tube. I mean, there's another issue that comes up with that as well is because you have all these ducts. Um, the airspeed at uh, close to the 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 duct, the material is is mm-hmm. it's going to have drag, so the airspeed is going to reduce. Yes. So actually, you can damage your your propellers if if they become too close because of the varying wind speeds. Yes, exactly. So there's a whole there's, so there's a whole host of uh, disadvantages too as well, but they obviously if you design it well enough, use the right materials and since this the the electric jet or the lilium is being a taxi and not a fighter aircraft (laughs) it's not going it's not going through vast changes in velocity and direction um you know these disadvantages don't matter as much as you know the the pros outweigh the cons yeah sure so the whole airframe as i said is constructed out of carbon fiber so it's very strong and light um as you know carbon fiber much stronger and lighter than aluminium um, so the initial model that um, 
they're going to release uh, is going to be able to carry two people uh, with the plan to have uh, a five-person carrying capability by, I think they said, 2025. Okay. So, yeah, the initial model is going to have a payload of 200 kilos uh, with a maximum speed of 300 kilometers an hour and a maximum range of 300 kilometers. So you can get maximum range in an hour. Um, so, I mean, the company plans is and, and really, really clever. Let's, let's just think about uh, what 300 kilometers is. What 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 is that? It's, it's, it's London to Paris. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you, you could take off from London and land in Paris within an hour. On something that's all electric. On something that's all electric and it's just you or you and another person. At the speed of around, what, that must be around a Formula One car? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I'm not... I, I, I think that's Formula about what 300 kilometers per hour is. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's fast. But it's brilliant because they plan, they plan to essentially be, they want to be an aerial Uber. They're going to have an app. They're going to have sort of sort of like ports that you can go to. You order a Lilium on your phone it arrives it picks you up and then it it's going to have uh, autopilot but it's also going to be you can fly it yourself so if you want to buy one and fly it, fly it around whatever okay um or you, you just have it let it take you to where you want to go um so they as i said they did their test flights in 2017 last year um it was a it was an autonomous test flight um but the video is absolutely stunning. You watch it and you go, this cannot be real. This has to be special effects. But it's real. I'll tell you what, um, I've, ju- I've just got to check out the website. Hang on, yeah, just give me two it, seconds. Do it. Okay. Oh, yo, what? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so the video just started as soon as I opened the, the website. And mm-hmm. wow. Wow. It doesn't. I mean, that that is the future. Like that is that is literally something that cannot exist in today's world. It just can't. Wow, it can. Yet, look at look at your yet it does. <laughs> I know. It's so cool. Wow. Wow, that, I mean, I'm, that's I'm really just, cool. I'm just watching it fly around now. But yeah, like that that was their maiden test flight. Their plan is to have um, manned flights by next year. I think. Well, 2019. So you know. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is actually so. Yeah, this is uh, remote controlled, right? At this point, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, so this this was a fully autonomous flight, but this is a full scale. This is a full scale prototype. This is exactly how they would build them. Wow! I, I tell you what, I found the name of the the other company that I was thinking about. It's called it's a company oh, yeah? called Flyer. Um, and, Flyer. Yes, uh, and they're actually a very similar company, um, where it's like a single person. Uh, electric flying vehicle and it's more like a quadcopter oh okay very cool they have had test flights with people now um but yeah Mm -hmm. you should you should look at them they're on instagram there i think there's a few videos on youtube uh something similar but i would say that actually the lilium is cooler yes i've i've been i've known about the lilium since maybe 20 well maybe since 2016 oh okay um so, because I remember seeing the test flight pop up and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but it's just, it is so beautiful. But And the great thing is, I remember watching it and thinking, okay, well, this is like a blue sky startup. They've got all these grand ideas, but, you know, it, that great idea, but maybe we're not going to get there. No, like they, I remember seeing that they'd, uh, hang on, I've lost the news thing. If you look at their news thing, they're constantly appointing new people. So their first head of communications was appointed just recently. Um, they've been hiring from Audi and Airbus. I think their oh, really? financial controller is ex Tesla. Um, yeah, that helps. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. So the funny thing is, when I saw that they were ex Tesla, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe you know once they're up and running, I wouldn't be surprised if Tesla's still around if they kind of bought them out because electric vehicles mm. kind of. You see, when you first mentioned this. I did think that Tesla may end up doing something like this at some point, but I think mm-hmm. I think rather than them buying them out, I think Tesla would probably just try and outdo them. That's true. Especially yeah, that... if Elon Musk becomes chair again. Yes. Yeah. Well, because I was when I was doing my research into this, I was looking into you know electric aircraft just generally, and I found again with uh, talking about your old friends uh, Airbus. Um, they developed uh, something very, very similar. 
um, yes, they did. Uh, called the Airbus E Fan. Yeah. Except it wasn't it wasn't VTOL. It was just a conventional. But interestingly, they cancelled it. Uh, so now, hang on. So the Lilium had their test flight in when did I say March twenty seventeen? Uh, a- April twenty seventeen. That was it. And the Airbus E Fan was cancelled in April twenty seventeen. Okay. Now, I am sure that is just coincidence. I'm sure it probably is. But, you know, you've got to think that this is something that, you know, they're very, very similar designs, very similar. Yeah, uh, variable pitch, fans. Yeah, very similar designs, very similar concepts. Interestingly, the Airbus, the larger company, were the ones who actually pulled out, whereas Lilium now, carried on. You, you tend to see that, though, when a company, especially a smaller company, starts up like that. They do tend to, especially when that's their one one sort of goal and design, they they would tend to, to sort of not beat but outrun the bigger company because obviously for Airbus... This would just be something that's a, a second thought. They would have a, a small team doing this. Like, mm-hmm. it's not what's going to make them money. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the smaller company is going to be more agile and quicker to react to things, whereas the smaller team are going to have to be sort of like contacting various people higher up the Airbus chain if they want more funding or they want to drastically change the design or whatever. So, I, I mean, essentially, what it probably came down to was. Uh, a corporate decision of like analysis over how well this is developing and the potential for them to make money out of it and yeah well it it, it says here they they cancelled the e-fan because they proposed uh, they prefer to concentrate on uh, a hybrid electric regional regional size jet aircraft okay which kind of makes sense because that's already their core market it, yeah it does yeah and i mean if if they were to produce some sort of hybrid that would that would be really cool Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you know, they're already changing the commercial market with their their new NEO um, group of yes. aircraft. Uh, and, I mean, uh, hybrids would just take that even further. But, I mean, I think from a commercial standpoint, we're, we're probably quite far away from getting anything electric or, or even hybrid functioning. And I think so, yeah. And in the commercial market. But they also, actually, they also made the, uh, well, hang on, let me just get a fact check this. Um, what, which one was the one that you were talking about earlier on? Uh, Lilium. No, 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 the the one that went oh, around. So, so, Solar Impulse 2. Ah, that was Solar Impulse, okay. Okay, cool. Never mind. No, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is pretty much, pretty much it from me, really. Um, it, I just thought it, it. I mean, it's not something that's been particularly in the news. No. Um, I mean, obviously they've been hiring new people, but it just popped into my head as actually this is a really really cool thing that I don't think many people know about, and it's been on my radar for a while, and I just wanted to have a chat about it. Yeah, I mean that that's really cool, and um, just for especially for me as well. I'm super into aircraft and and the oh, aerospace industry that. as a whole. Um, oh, cool! So, well, hence my visit to Airbus today. That does make sense now, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no. Thank you for telling me about that. That's that's something really oh, interesting that I'm sure I'm going to go to uh, my flatmate after we have finished recording this, and I'm going to tell him all about it. Fantastic! And honestly, the whole like the whole electric aircraft thing, I or I could have fallen down a rabbit hole whilst doing this research. There's so much out there to look into. There um, is. This is what I love about doing this podcast: is you look into something. And then, you know, you go, oh, well, that's quite interesting. Let's look at that. Oh, that, that, that's quite interesting. Cool. Let's look at that. And you just end up, if you're not careful, you can go off on a massive tangent and completely forget what you're going to originally talk about. Yeah. But yeah, you it's, do. Because there's so, there's so much cool stuff going on that oh, you, there just, is. you just don't know about until you look into it. And, and it's funny as well, because the, the aerospace industry as a whole, especially on the commercial side of things, hasn't really changed, at least at the core design, uh, in quite a long time. I mean, yeah. they've made all these little sort of um, modifications, like with the Neo, where you cut down noise, you cut down fuel uh, fuel costs, um, and, and fuel burn, and all this kind of thing. But when you look at new methods for transporting people, 
around. Mm-hmm. It's it's sort of been very recent. I'd say since since drones started becoming a big thing, mm-hmm. there's been a lot more investment into the um, research and development of these these um, electric vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since uh, since Tesla started as well. I think Tesla's only done the world a world of good. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I, th- I, I think I might have mentioned this in a previous episode. I think, as you say, it's like Tesla kind of pushing it forward. And I think, yeah, I think I said before, drones just meaning that battery tech was forced to kind of improve to kind of meet the market demand for hobbyists. And then off the back of that, it then meant that commercial battery tech was then able to improve. Um, yeah. And that was then able to drive all this new innovation. Yeah. and that just... because, because suddenly the technology was... A, was more advanced and more things to be done with it and speaking of battery development as well i know that um i I watched a video on youtube the other day by uh, a guy called styro pyro um who does a lot of uh he's he's really crazy guy he essentially builds homemade lasers and he made what what he is (laughs) calling going to subscribe right now i know he is he made what is what he's calling the world's most powerful handheld laser um, oh, and essentially there, there's a, a battery in that which is the same size as a, a AAA I think it is but outputs about a hundred times the power what is the energy density of that damn thing? I, I don't think the uh, I think it's like quite a short lifespan but it, it the output oh, okay. of it so is it, a lot higher kind of thing it's going to have sort of some massive kind of boost converter on it or yeah, something that's something gonna, like that knock it. But, um, right okay but yeah just something interesting that's another channel for, for you guys to check out is Styropyro on YouTube Styropyro you're going to have to add that into the notes I will yeah yeah I'm, sure. I'm going to check that out that's so cool Right, I mean, I, I, I think that's it. My, my brain is kind of melted from yours, but also is now spinning with electric aircraft from mine. And I think we've chosen two really good topics this you know week. No, I think we have. This, is, this has actually been probably, for me, my, my favourite episode to record because this has been two oh, things yeah. that, I'm, that I've, I've really enjoyed talking about. So, Absolutely, yeah, and I've had a great time. I mean... So just to cover, so I remember yours was, hang on, let me see if I can remember this. It was using quantum entanglement to, was it unfold proteins, pr- flavoured proteins for analysis or something, something yeah, like so that? Yeah, it so was, it was using quantum entanglement to um, look at the structure of proteins called flavins, which are uh, enzymes used for, um, used for energy metabolism in the body. That was it. And it was, yeah, sort of the fact that we, we use use it so then we don't damage the proteins yes. when we're examining exactly. them. Exactly. Um, and then we covered the, the double slit experiment and also some, so apparently some particle time travel as well. Uh, and... Not particle time travel, then. <laughs> no, no, okay, in, information time travel. Be careful with travel. your words, Sam. <laughs> yes, thank you for picking me up on that. Um, nevertheless, some stupidly cool concepts in as you say kind of in a very classical kind of way of thinking but still unbelievably cool to even consider yeah. and the fact that they work is just mad <laughs> yeah so essentially it was a quantum phenomenon thinking about through thinking about it through uh, a classical mindset basically yeah and then of course you spoke about the um the solar impulse two, and then this lilium mm-hmm. electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, um, yes. and how it's going to be a taxi, and I, I'm going to be able to order it from an app on my phone, and then travel <laughs> so cool. travel from London to Paris in an hour. Yeah, uh, and the fact and the fact this isn't blue sky thinking. They've built a prototype and it flies. Exactly. That that's what's amazing. Oh, yeah, two very so very cool topics. Thank you for joining us for our brief delve into the world of quantum physics and aeronautical engineering. If you're interested in learning more about either of the topics we've discussed, the links will be in the show notes. Alternatively, if you'd like to contact us, just order a Lilium and tell it to our faces. Um, But, you know, if you can't do that, our email is sparksquarks at gmail.com. Oh, wow. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook (laughs) at sparksquarks. We're also on iTunes as well. Of course we are. Yes, we should have said thank you, Adam, for sorting that out. Yeah. Anyway, that's it from us. See See you you next time. time. 
I'm Dan, uh, your engineering host, and I'm joined as ever with, by uh, by Simon. No, not by <laughs> me. Sideways. Jesus, man. Oh my god, that is going to go at the end of the episode. Christ alive, Simon. What is? What, what is a my person brain doing? to be uh, be mistaken for? 